The opening statement in the Constitution of the United States says this, that we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. I don't know what part of that we don't get anymore. That was written by men who cared about this country deeply. Financial Issues with Dan Celia. Welcome back to Dan Celia's Financial Issues. Fred Jackson, Teddy James, sitting in for Dan today. So much going on, as we've been mentioning. Kathleen Sebelius, uh, Health and Human Services Secretary, has begun her testimony before a congressional committee. Uh, They want to know what's going on. Uh, Why all the glitches in Obamacare? She is going to be asked if she hasn't already, or what about the president's statements about you get to keep the your insurance if you like it, but we found out in the last couple of days that is not the case. Millions of Americans having their, uh, their health care uh, insurance canceled because of Obamacare, because of changes made in the so-called grandfathering clause. Plenty to talk about, and we want to talk right now with... Uh, one of our uh, trusted friends, one of the best-known Christian broadcasters in the country and authors, Janet Parshall. Janet, welcome to the program. Good morning. It's wonderful to be with you. Good to be with you. You know, let me just ask you right up front. You've been watching things going on in Washington for years there, Janet. Is what's going on right now with regards to Obamacare, with regards to Benghazi, uh, is it going to stick this time? It, it, do you think the country is waking up to the fact that this administration is not doing things to help the country, but doing things to the country? Well, you must have been sitting at the dinner table while Craig and I were having the exact same <laughs> conversation. You know, it's amazing. I, I shake my head, and I, in fact, I've been riveted to the hearings this morning with Kathleen Sebelius and listening to what's being told and the defense of this utter debacle the inarguable, objective facts that multiple millions of Americans are going to lose their health insurance. I heard one Democratic operative this morning saying, well, those aren't letters of cancellation. They're letters of transition. (laughs) You're moving off of one planet onto another, because buried deep within the framework of this new law is the idea that there have to be certain standards And if your policy doesn't come to that standard, well, then you know what? You're going to get off that policy and you're going to get on another one. I find it interesting because the very voices who are demanding that we march in lockstep to the government's idea of how we should look well to the ways of our household are the same people who demand choice when it comes to so-called reproductive rights, but apparently no choice when it comes to our own health insurance. So there's a bigger transcendent question that you asked, and it's a great one. I don't have a clue except for one thing. I'm not... I'm not frightened because God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but I think we need to be Nehemiahs. I think we need to be good farmers, and I think we need to be watching the signs. One of the reasons why it may not stick is because we have a fourth unelected branch of the government, and it is the secular press. When the secular press moves from reporting objective facts to becoming advocates for a particular worldview, well, like the Scripture says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. So you're walking past the TV in the family room and you hear a 30-second sound bite or a three-minute package, which is long in the news world, and you hear it said, therefore, it must be ex- inspired uh, ex-cathedra. It has to be truth. After all, it came out of that TV, right? It's got to be right. So Americans say, okay, well, that's the way it is. And it ends up sticking because in our busy lives, our stressful lives, we don't take the time to study to show ourselves approved, getting into the facts. That's why what AFR does is so unbelievably important, because we are what the world calls the, quote, alternative media. Mm. Yes, we are, and we shall ever be that way, and we take that banner proudly. What it means is we're going to give you, in the words of Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. There is another way to look at this. If the advocacy is going to be done by the major networks, then we, the alternative press, are now have the responsibility of saying, but well, wait a minute, fact check, that's not the way it is. Now, will we be, be loved and embraced by the culture at large? I think not. But we're responsible for proclaiming what is truth. It is inarguable that people are being damaged by this new law. I got some hate mail today that was off the charts, and my attitude is, well, that's all right, I'll suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous criticism, but I'm not going to retreat from proclaiming to people the facts. You decide, listeners, what you want to do, but we're going to give you the facts as they are. And the facts are, there's a new dark shadow over Washington. The intrusion by the government into our personal lives 
has never been worse. It defies everything we believe as human beings. In fact, I'm so glad we started this segment by tackling about those basics in the Constitution. The founders never meant the government to supply all our needs according to their riches in Washington. It was never meant to grow this big. It was never meant to be that intrusive into our personal lives. And through our own slovenly nature, we've allowed it to happen. We've gotten this mentality that the government should take care of us. And as a result of that, we've allowed the government to be overgrown. And unless we go back to that idea of, of taking care of ourselves, of looking well to the ways of our own household, we're in trouble. Janet, you mentioned about the secular media. Were you encouraged at all by what you have seen from CBS and NBC in the last 48 hours or so? CBS and NBC doing headline stories about the fact that the president was not telling the truth that you could keep your health insurance package. They did major exposés on that. And then CBS 60 Minutes on Sunday night uh, doing a revelation on the Benghazi story, basically yeah. verifying everything the conservatives have said, the truth about Benghazi. Is there is there some degree of encouragement there when those media who have been the lapdogs for the president the last five years start to do those kinds of stories? Well, I think what happens is when the preponderance of evidence is so overwhelming, at some point they have to preserve their own reputation. <laughs> and the facts are just overwhelming at this point in time. You know, it's interesting. Let me go to uh, NBC. I actually picked up on a piece yesterday and talked about it on my program written by Lisa Myers. I pointed out that Lisa's sister, Dee Dee, had the same job for the Clinton administration that Jay Carney has for the Obama administration. So this is not a part of the vast right-wing conspiracy by any stretch of the imagination. When they start enumerating the facts, when they start pointing out that a 62-year-old man in South Carolina who is preparing for retirement was paying premiums of $228 a month and is now told his premiums are $2,282 a month, and he's saying, look, you've just ruined my retirement. I can't possibly do that. Then we start to understand that, well, wait a minute, we weren't being paranoid. You know, the people who say, well, you people are always paranoid. Well, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean that they're not out to get you. And the fact of the matter is, the reality in, in that big, hefty, one-sixth of our economy bill that nobody bothered to read on the Hill that sadly was affirmed as constitutional by the United States Supreme Court is now one of the most grotesque intrusions in our life, and people are going to be damaged. You know, this idea of saying, well, when it's all said and done, we'll all have better health care. Well, what about the opportunity to say, you know, we don't want that kind of a policy. We're a young couple. We're just starting out. We'd rather not do it. What we're starting to hear is more and more people say, I'm going to pay the penalty rather than step into the insurance pool. And what's going to happen is they'll be able to endure that for a year or so. And the rumblings we're hearing in Washington is that they will, over the next several years, raise that penalty to the point that it's so onerous, you have no choice but then to say, uncle, I'm going to go get the policy instead. Some are also saying that these market increases in uh, the premiums are really the tax, the backdoor taxes to try to fund the new Affordable Care Act. So, folks, we're in trouble. There's no other way to say it. And, again, it isn't a matter of being fearful. It's a matter of saying, okay, there's storm clouds on the horizon. You, know, you better tighten your belt and let's put our shoulder to the wheel here. we got some work to do. Ms. Parcelldale, uh, kind of to switch gears, we've been talking a lot about the, the military and how they've labeled um, – evangelicals, Catholics, and especially uh, specifically FRC and American Family Association as hate groups. Um, what are you hearing about that? Is, I mean, obviously there's not a lot of media coverage about that other than with the alternative media such as AFA. Uh, yeah. but what are you hearing about it? You know, it's, and, and I talk about this quite frequently on my show as well. You know, here's the thing that I can't quite figure out. How can a small little group led by... Mickey or Mikey, however you want to say his name, <laughs> Weinstein, uh, this atheist group inherent within the military ranks have the kind of clout that they do. Why do they allow pictures to be taken down at military bases? Why do they allow uh, columns written by chaplains to be pulled off of websites? Why are they trying to get uh, the allegiance to God taken out of the Air Force Academy oath? Where do they get this kind of power and clout? Well, the answer to that question is, all along, there's been this belief that the military, which is historically conservative in nature, if you can change the nature of the military, you can change the culture at large. So the military has been viewed as kind of a sociological Petri dish for years. Go in, dabble, experiment, and if you can change that, you'll have an easier time changing the culture at large. You know, it's interesting. I remember interviewing Mark Potok of the Southern Poverty Law Center. I invited him to join us at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention, and I wanted to take up this idea of arbitrarily finger-pointing and calling certain groups hate groups. And I asked him why he decided to make that kind of a list. And he goes, well, I, uh, and he stumbled. Uh, I said, well, what do you plan on doing with the list? Uh, didn't really say. 
Well, I'll tell you what he's done with that list. He's widely distributed it, and he's gotten other people thinking that somehow the new definition of hate is, if you don't agree with me, you're a hater. Forget the marketplace of ideas. And unfortunately, he's getting a lot of traction. So I think it's imperative, and the American Family Association has been doing this and other groups. When that kind of label gets placed on us, we have to push back strongly, because if we don't, believe me, what's coming down the road a piece is going to be far more problematic. And i give you two examples. In very short order, when we saw this, when we heard the oral arguments on the DOMA case in Prop 8 before the United States Supreme Court, as Scalia pointed out in his dissent, if you don't agree with the current cultural trendy view of what marriage should be, then you are, quote, enemy of the nation. Now, if you are deemed to be an enemy of the nation, in short order, legislation will be introduced that said, if you dare to articulate your disapproval, then you are an enemy. I point to the ordinance that just got passed in San Antonio, Texas. That says if you've ever said or done anything disparagingly to someone who has same-sex attraction, you may not get a government contract and you may not run for office. What is this, the Soviet Union? You can't run for office if your particular worldview doesn't march in lockstep with some members sitting on a common council? So we're going to see not less but more of this. The Employment Non-Discrimination Act is getting traction in the Senate. That's going to say to nonprofit organizations, hey, we don't care what your worldview is. That man is a homosexual and you can't fire him. But well, wait a minute, we're a Christian school. Well, everybody here has to have the same worldview. Don't care, you fire him, you fall under the heavy weight of federal law, we're going to sue you six ways to Sunday. This is the beginning, not the end. And I guess if you step back and you put big theological lenses on all of this, we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, the more that we align ourselves with Jesus, the more we have the opportunity to be called blessed. Not my words, Jesus's. If mm-hmm. we're persecuted for his name's sake, he said that that would be deemed to be a blessing. But I do believe the day is coming, in short order, where the wheat and the shaft are going to be separated, the sheep and the goats are going to be separated, and we're going to have to ask ourselves, individually, before the throne of grace, Lord, at what point do I say this far and no farther? When will I no longer bend my knee to Caesar, but will bow in humility before my great king? That's not an easy choice. Most of us would rather sidestep that, but history is replete with believers who have had to make that same choice, I believe that choice is coming rapidly to us. Now, you had mentioned about the uh, the marketplace of ideas, which is part of the title of your new book. Uh, can you tell us about your book real quick? What I did is I looked back and I realized that living in a sin-sick, fallen, pagan society is nothing new. I give you the Babylonian captivity. So what I did is I unpacked Jeremiah 29. God always pursues us. He always wants to redeem his people And so even when they were in captivity, through his messenger, Jeremiah, God sends a letter to the people of God who are held in the sin-sick culture, how they should not just survive, but how they should thrive. And so what I did is unpack the directives that the Lord gave to his people there. And interestingly, but not surprisingly, he is, after all, God. The same principles God gave his people in captivity are exactly the same principles that we, his people, need to subscribe to today. People still caught in a sin-sick world turned upside down, a markedly pagan culture. If God's people could survive then for 70 years in captivity, we can still survive and thrive today. Janet, uh, very quick, we only have a couple of minutes left. You and your husband, Craig, live in Virginia. The other political story going on right now, the governor's race there. I was looking at a brand new poll out this morning, and it appears to be narrowing between the Democrat Terry McAuliffe and uh, the state attorney general Ken Cuccinelli. Uh, is that what you're hearing? Is that uh, new poll consistent with the, the race getting tighter there? It is indeed. And a mark of desperation is when you have to send Hillary Clinton out to campaign for you. <laughs> and when he, they said Hillary to campaign for Terry McAuliffe, I thought, well, he knows how difficult this is. But if I could get Ken Cuccinelli aside, and he's a wonderful man, I would say, I don't know who whispered in your ear, retreat from the social issues. Don't do that. I know that it's easy and probably more widely embraced to talk about the economy and jobs, but don't ever retreat from those issues that define the soul of a state and the heart of a nation. People have very strong feelings on these particular areas, and they're looking for people who lead. C.S. Lewis said that when you don't have that core set of values, you are the equivalent of a man without a chest. We don't want leaders who are chestless. We want leaders who believe in a strong core set of principles and are willing us to take us somewhere. Leadership isn't demanded. It's earned by people casting a vision and say, now follow me. So I think what's happening in these last few weeks of the campaign, Cuccinelli has gotten more bolder. 
on some of those issues that really and truly define him as an individual and who should be defining us as the Commonwealth of Virginia. And as a result, guess what? You've seen the narrowing of the gap. Note to file, don't retreat. Would you say the same for the uh, National Republican Party right now? (laughs) With five exclamation points. You would think with everything going on that, uh, you know, these would, would be great campaign issues for the Republicans heading into next year's midterms. But uh, everybody's saying you know, it's a camp divided right now. Well, it is a camp divided. And, you know, I've been one who's been loath to talk about a third party because our country hasn't supported it thus far. And, you know, in the world of baseball, I'm not sure I want to do a sacrificial fly. If you decide <laughs> that you're going to have that third party and you just really don't have the traction to win you've basically acquiesced for the next two or four years, depending on what the election cycle is. So it's tough, but I think what's happening is that the Republican Party has no sense of itself. You know, in some respects, you feel like William Wallace saying to the clans in Scotland, unite the clans. This party right now is so divided. Uh, You've got one that are just absolutely afraid to touch any social issues, and the others who understand those core issues that define the Republican Party from its inception. What's going to happen is the Republican Party is going to shoot itself in the foot. There's going to be a splintering. If they can't discover who they are again, if they can't lead by principle, if they can't pull together the desperate parts of the party, then they're never, ever going to win. Here's where I get frustrated. Janet, we're going to have to leave it right there. We're fresh out of time. We're going to get you back and discuss this a whole lot more. Thanks so much, friend. You take care. Janet Parshall, Christian broadcaster and author. Always a joy to have her observations on what is going on in Washington. You're listening to Dan Celia's Financial Issues. Fred Jackson, Teddy James sitting in for Dan today. Got to take a break, but we'll be right back. We'll try our phone system and the phone system 866-300-9298, 866-300-9298. We'd love to hear from you after the break. Hi, this is Dan Celia. I sure would appreciate it if you would consider partnering with me in the Ministry of Financial Issues. You'll have access to my stock picks that come out every Monday, along with my commentary. You'll get access to our conference call that I do with our partners once a month, our alert system that I send out as often as necessary to tell you when to sell a stock, maybe give you some comfort during a volatile time, or maybe when to buy a particular stock. You'll get access to the asset allocation model so you'll know how to manage the portfolio right for you and much, much more. We sure would appreciate it if in your stewardship, you would partner with Financial Issues. Go to financialissues.org, financialissues.org. Partner with us and support this ministry. It sure would be a blessing. Go to financialissues.org, financialissues.org. 